Steve, if everything that Hubbard wrote was unchangeable, how come David Miscavige has, on multiple occasions, issued revisions to what Hubbard wrote? How is that possible if his writings were sacrosanct? The cynical side of me has what I believe to be clearly the answer, and that is another way to scam more money from the public. So is that the answer? Because it sure looks like it. Hey, Steve, thanks for the question. And yes, of course, the answer is that Scientology is a money-making scam. And so anything and everything they're doing is an effort to either uh, milk or bilk more money out of their existing membership or figure out ways to create good public relations or good imaging uh, with the non-Scientologist world so as to try to create friendly, uh, you know, uh, PR ideas about Scientology. They're helping the environment. They're helping people. They're a good set of people. They fight for human rights. They do drug abuse counseling or, you know, drug addiction uh, help and study help and, you know, illiteracy help and, and criminal help and all these things that Scientology helps with. All of those are, are PR and uh, membership recruitment lines. And that's what those things are about. So they're either, you know, that, that's, that's basically what's, what's going on there. Now, I thought I'd answer this question also and comment on why do people fall for it? How is it that David Miscavige can, uh, you know, run Scientology now? And he's run it for a long time. I mean, let's keep that in mind that Miscavige has basically taken over the, the idea of source, in Scientology, right? L. Ron Hubbard was the source, and he called himself that with a capital S, I am source, and uh, and made a big deal out of it. And he also wrote in Mary's policy letters, most especially keeping Scientology working, that Scientology was a complete body of work. It was an integrated whole that worked. It wasn't a perfect system, but it was a workable system, Hubbard said. And he claimed that there are very few workable systems in the world. Well, Hubbard was full of shit on that. There are lots of things that work in this world, not just Scientology. But that was Hubbard's way, as he was always trying to position Scientology as senior to everything else going on in the world or even the universe. And that's a necessary part of the, uh, you know, of, of, of the propaganda. You have to convince people that what they're doing is super, super important. Now, nobody imagined that L. Ron Hubbard uh, was anything more than a, a, a guy or a man. He's not a god in Scientology, and he's not beyond reproach or mistake. It's not that anybody believes Hubbard never made a mistake or that he didn't have issues or problems of his own. It's, but they don't bring him down to the level of you and me. I mean, he's not a regular Joe guy. Hubbard is this, you know, considered this genius researcher and philosopher and, and and all of that by Scientologists. Um, but where, where I'm going with this business of he's not infallible and that mistakes could have been made over the years is that um, this opens the door to possibilities of revising or changing or modifying or correcting. And that's probably the word that is actually more appropriate for how this is positioned with Scientologists is that Miscavige has to correct errors that were made along the way, not by Hubbard in his writings or research, but in how that research or how those writings were interpreted, translated, um, dictated, uh, or sorry, transcribed from dictation, because almost all of Hubbard's uh, books I think except for Dianetics, almost every one of Hubbard's books were dictated uh, on tape and then transcribed and uh, from Science of Survival forward. And so Miscavige has figured out a way to keep Hubbard blameless for mistakes, errors, problems, and still give an out, still give a reasonable explanation that Scientologists are more than happy to accept that the alterations or changes through the years that happened with Scientology's work that made it unworkable or presented problems with it or made it difficult to understand was because of these transcriptionists or, or secretaries or editors, copy editors. And, um, and so this is how Scientologists buy into this. 
Now, the fact of the matter is that that is actually true. You know, alterations do happen because of transcription errors and copy editors changing things over the years. And that's, you know, it's not all just a lie. I mean, there were things about the dictated, transcribed books like Science of Survival where they were very hard to read. And admittedly so, they are easier to read now that you know, all the semicolons and commas and words and everything were changed. Now, I'm not saying that that Miscavige isn't lying or that Miscavige isn't taking advantage of Scientologists. Like I said at the beginning of this whole thing, it's a money-making scam, and that's what Scientology is all about. But there were, the, the reason I'm giving a little bit of credibility to Miscavige's claims about how there were errors along the way that needed to be fixed is because that kind of thing happened all the time when Hubbard himself was still around. And in fact, in 1976, I think it was, 76 or 78, there was a a bulletin called Tech Correction Roundup, where Hubbard had discovered that people had been, you know, changing or altering things, or he scapegoated them. (laughs) You know, he didn't actually mess it up, but he was more than happy to scapegoat some people to blame them for the problems. And a whole revision, massive revision of a number of different things across Scientology was was done. And the other thing about the history of Scientology you need to know that that lends credibility to this whole idea of actual errors and changes made that, that nobody really wanted is that there were periods of time where other people were able to write issues and put their name to it. And these were get approved through Hubbard, but they weren't Hubbard's writing, but they were issued as bulletins or policy letters. Now, those happened officially as HCO, official Hubbard Communications Office bulletins and policy letters. For example, Mary Sue wrote policies or other crew on this in the Sea Org wrote policies, and some of those ended up with L. Ron Hubbard's name on it as though he had written it. And those had to be, sometimes those would get reviewed. People would go, oh, my God, that's not Ron. And they would get canceled or, or, or you know, knocked out or taken out or revised the way, the way Hubbard wanted it. Other issue types were put out, like board policy letters and board technical bulletins. Uh, this, these aren't around anymore. But in the 70s, these were a thing, and they were kind of a big thing. And the issues were were printed on cream-colored paper rather than white paper to indicate that you were reading something that was technical or you were reading some policy for the church, but it wasn't written by Ron, but it was still had the force of policy or a tech that had been written by Ron. So these were issued as board technical bulletins, as in board of directors of the Church of Scientology, whoever those people were. That was the authority under which these bulletins and and policy letters were issued. So um, a lot of those, in fact, almost all of them, if they weren't canceled on review after a few years, they were converted in the 1980s to official Hubbard-signed bulletins or policy letters. And, And it wasn't Hubbard's work. It was somebody else's work, but they just changed it and put Hubbard's name on it and revised it so that it would all be purely on source, you see, is the idea here. And so they they blatantly took things that had not been written by Hubbard at all, and they put Hubbard's name on it, issued it under the same heading and the same issue type that Hubbard's, that Hubbard-only writings are supposed to be issued under, Okay. And um, anyway, and so it's kind of a a maze of trying to, you know, you'd have to really have a deep understanding or access to the whole revision history of all the issues that have been written in Scientology. And there are thousands of them in order to know which ones were actually L. Ron Hubbard's versus which were somebody else's that just had Hubbard's name put on it. And this has been a thing that's been going on for 50, you know, the 50 years that that it was around that these things were being issued while Hubbard was still alive. Uh, Well, sorry, I guess I should say 36 years. Hubbard died in 86. So, yeah, 36 years. Okay. um, So there's a so in other words, the reality of this situation is that it's a mess and you really don't know from one issue or bulletin to the next whether it's actually L. Ron Hubbard or not. 
But everything I'm telling you is stuff that I learned, not by reading L. Ron Hubbard and t- him telling me all this, but just through the experience of having been a staff member and Sea Org member who kept their eyes open and, and their ears open. And I was very interested in um, in this stuff and in learning about this and how issues happen. And I happened to, just as more added color for you guys and more information about my Scientology past, and you know, all these little things pop up and I get to tell you guys about them that I've that I've forgotten about. I did proofreading for material that was issued in 19 um in the in the late 1980s when this first round of these revisions were happening uh that I that were one of the rounds I should say not the first round but one of these rounds were were occurring after Hubbard died so Hubbard died they went through the entire library all the books all the issues all the everything and they changed and converted over a bunch to you know the the official types like I said and they canceled all of the board technical bulletins and all the board policy letters as off source. Those weren't correct. They were not L. Ron Hubbard's words. Well, you know, a lot of things have been issued under L. Ron, with L. Ron Hubbard's name on them that were not L. Ron Hubbard's words. I got a chance to sort of first peek behind the curtain on all of this and start seeing and learning how this process works of revisions to the, 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 the Scientology works um, because I was doing proofreading. I was down in for training in Los Angeles and they were revising some of these materials and they needed proofreaders. And so I did that and it was fun. It was fun to sit there and proofread the, the material and learn how to do that um, and learn the copy editor notations and things like that. Um, but it was also eye-opening to see how every comma, every word that does get changed has to go through this full approval process. There's a number of people who have to look at it all the way up to the top, of course, through the office of RTC. So, and at this point, that's pretty much miscavige. Um, so anyway, just kind of interesting. Uh, and thanks for the question, Steve. I hope that that gives you some insight into why you know the the sort of the some of the history of of the of the issues and how that all works, which your question prompted me to think about. Um, of course, Scientologists buy into all of this because of all the reasons we've already you know gone over ad nauseum about cognitive dissonance and motivated reasoning and all of the confirmation bias. So uh, anyway, that's how that works. 